Welcome to Hall and Estates and Succession Planning, a series of podcasts hosted by Ian Hall and Susanna Popovic Montag. The podcast you are listening to will provide information and insights into estate planning in Canada. From the office of Hull and Hall, here are Ian and Susanna. Hi, and welcome to Hull and Estates and Succession Planning. I'm Ian Hull, and I have my special guest today, Jordan Ayton. Hey, Ian, how are you doing? I'm terrific, thanks. That's good. So we're uh, we're missing Susanna this week, and uh, we're going to miss her for two weeks in a row. Actually, she's uh, enjoying the sunny uh, side of the Caribbean. Oh, sounds good. S- sounds very good. She didn't want to take her estate lawyer with her. Or? No, she didn't no. ask. Right. Neither yeah. of us were invited. No, that's a shame. So uh, we're casual today because we're going to talk about a casual fireside discussion, and the fireside discussion is about drafting wills okay. and some of the sort of uh, more personal aspects of it. I was at, I had the pleasure of speaking to a group the other night, uh, and uh, one of the people speaking was relaying the uh, the message about what how personal the actual will drawing process is in itself. We, as lawyers, live and breathe the kind of clinical, uh, you know, black and white world of will drafting. But we forget sometimes that drawing a will is a very personal event, and it and what you often will be putting down on paper is from the heart. Absolutely. And uh, I thought you drawing, uh, your, in your will drawing practice, do you see that kind of aspect of it? And do you sometimes have to remind yourself that you've got to be sensitive to that part of the non-clinical dra- will drafting process? I think it's true you have to be aware of the intimacy of that, uh, of that uh, process. I find that people come to me, you know, like, like in all areas of, of the world, the, the fact is that people have different personalities and people treat the will preparation uh, a, a differently. So some people will come to me and they're just, they want to get it done. It's something to check off their list. It's not a very intimate situation. They just want to get it done. I got kids, I got a spouse, let's get it done. Boom, I check it off. It's a, it's a business transaction. Mm-hmm. Others, uh, for others, it's, it's a much more emotional um, taking stock of their life type situation. Uh, we talk a lot about the family, about relationships. Uh, you know, it's not purely about, you know, assets in a financial transaction, but it's about, you know, other, other aspects of their life. I always say that, that a will is sort of the last thing that, that a parent says to their kids. And if you look at it in that way and you take it to that, to that extreme, then, yeah, it's going to be a very intimate uh, discussion. So, and, and the second part of it then, do you find when someone passes away and they come, the, their, their family comes to see you to administer the estate, do you find uh, that, that that too can be a bit personal, that, that indeed they are maybe for the first time hearing the words of, the one, of a loved one who's passed away and, and that initial stage of dealing with the assets, although business-like, uh, as a personal element too? Absolutely. I mean, th- you know, there's the obvious grieving process that, that is going on. So, and you overlay that with something like, you know, the administration of a state. A, they're worried about n- not knowing what they're doing. They've never done it before. It's their loved one. And they're also, as, as you say, they're, they're seeing these, the last words that their mom or dad is going to say to them on the page. And especially if that isn't, isn't what they're expecting, what, however mom or dad deals with them, if it's not what they're expecting, then that even puts another layer of, of emotion onto it. And, and yeah, it's, it's, a very, it's a very difficult time. All right, so when we are, and you're talking about expectations, and certainly uh, children have, uh, maybe have fixed expectations before their parents die as to how they're gonna deal with their estate. One of the expectations that many parents uh, may or may not communicate is the, um, the idea of giving back and giving back to charity. Yeah. Uh, we often, I, I met with a client the other day who said, you know, look, I, I was talking about his, his existence and, and his, he's an elderly guy and he said, look, you know, I'm a, I was self-made. I came off the trains and uh, built my own insurance business and no one ever gave me a dime, but I'm not so foolish to understand, to believe that the world hasn't been giving me great things. And I walk into uh, churches or my local church that was donated many, many generations before, and I know that although I'd like to think I made my, my own way in life, I have been a benefactor of others, mm-hmm. other charitable uh, mm-hmm. generosity. And uh, I thought that was an interesting perspective yeah. uh, because he, he had, was a very wealthy man and was talking about how he wanted to consider, obviously his family was priority one, but consider some charitable gifting. Right. And, uh, and so 
how do you address that typically when your clients come in to talk about charitable gifting uh, and, and the dynamic between charities and wanting to give back to your community and to your family? Well, again, you, and you hit it right, at, right on the head at the beginning. It's all about expectations. So if the kids are not expecting that some amount is going to charity, especially if it's a significant amount, uh, that is going to cause problems in its own right. Uh, leaving aside if it's a charity or it's somebody else, if it's not going to them and they're anticipating that, that's going to be a problem. Right. So certainly when, when, when we're discussing about uh, leaving to charities, leaving to the kids, uh, we encourage our clients to discuss that with their kids. And, and, and it's, an, it's a great lesson to teach to your kids that, look, well, I'm giving back to, to, to society, to people who are less fortunate. I mean, it's hard to argue with that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's, it's, it's even harder to argue about that while the person's alive than after the fact when it just becomes dollars and cents. And so I think that that's an important first step about that. And then, you know, clients um, often ask what kind of advice I can give them about charities. I mean, there's, there's certainly a, a tax benefit to it, for sure. Um, but often people will come to me with, with, with ideas about specific charities. Sometimes it's more of just a general charitable uh, idea. So I guess uh, the, the communication element is vital at that point as best as you can to encourage your clients to have some dialogue so that the expectations are managed. Absolutely. I mean, unmet expectations, whether those expectations are reasonable. I mean, people say to me, well, I don't really care what their expectations are. They, they can, they'll get what they'll get. The reality is that's, I mean, and you know as a, as a litigator that that's what dri that drives these unmet expectations, whether they're reasonable or completely off the chart. Right. If they're not at least addressed, then, then you're in trouble. Well, as we both know, have children of our own, it's always hard to meet the expectations of the children. <laughs> I'm but still trying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still never going to achieve that goal. But I see your point in that uh, the unmet expectations can be managed, and it, and it should be managed, because it doesn't do the charity any good either to receive a gift that they're going to have to fight for with the family later. And, uh, and, and coming back to the personal element of the process is that presumably if, if, you, if they are the client that is taking this as a personal moment in time when they're creating their will, part of what they're doing is they're saying, that's what I want. That is part of the legacy I want. And, uh, and so if that is something you want to close the loop on, so to speak, is uh, I guess a big part of that would be to communicate that to your family. Yeah, I mean, that you're, 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 you're certainly saying something in your will, but, but what's even more valuable is saying something during your lifetime. All right. Well, I think uh, this is a good point to sort of wrap up. We're going to do a little mini-series. We have the benefit of Jordan Ayton here today, and uh, he has a terrific book called The Family War at thefamilywar.com that I highly recommend you uh, take a look at. And uh, we're going to knock uh, a little bit more time off Jordan's day today uh, for a second part of the series that will air the following week to talk a little bit about some of the mechanics of the charitable giving and some of the specifics because you touched on an important part that there are tax elements to it and I think it's worth uh, delving into that a little bit. Great. So on, uh, on that basis we'll uh, wrap up today's podcast and thank you very much for joining again. Uh, we have uh, enjoyed uh, having our uh, our esteemed colleague and, uh, and terrific lawyer, uh, Jordan Nate, with us today. Much missing uh, Susanna as she sits on the beach and enjoys some well-deserved time off. You have been listening to Holland Estates and Succession Planning by Ian Hall and Susanna Popovic Montag. The podcast that you've been listening to has been provided as an information service. It is a summary of current issues in estates and estate planning. It is not legal advice and you are reminded to always speak with a legal professional regarding your specific circumstance. To listen to other Hall & Hall podcasts or leave any questions or comments, please visit our website at hallestatemediation.com.